to formally welcome everybody to um, Lakeside Chat Stories from the Early Days at Lake Merritt. Um, my name is Katie Noonan, and I'm um, one of the two co chairs with um, David Wofford of Rotary Nature Center Friends. And uh, we welcome you today. Um, it's been quite a week, it's been quite a year. We want to um, recognize as we begin that. Um, our refuge and the focus of our um, interest in our program today um, exists on um, uh, Ohlone land that was uh, appropriated um, during the course of history. We heard wonderful um, uh, information about that, a presentation about that at the 150th um, uh, anniversary program back in October. Uh, we also want to acknowledge that this is a very difficult time for many people in our, our community. Uh, we have a raging um, homeless crisis. We have a raging um, pandemic and many people are suffering. And um, this is um, you know, an immediate concern. While we focus on other important concerns um, of, of history and of um, our challenges to the future, we want to also acknowledge the present. And, you know, we're the Rotary Nature Center friends and with the primary stories at Lake Merritt, we come together uh, in a world where many people have been shaken by those things. And, and yet uh, many of us continue to get up each day and endeavor to uh, make the world a better place. And that's what uh, we're about here tonight at our, our, our Lakeside Chats. And I'm so happy and honored to have him here as our guest speaker. And yet I wanted to share with you guys that uh, when I met him a couple of years ago, I, I, I immediately disliked him. And I wanted to take this opportunity to acknowledge that and to share why. And that's because, uh, you see, uh, when I was a youngster, uh, I used to have to go to Oakland City Council meetings every uh, Tuesday night. And they started at 7.30 and they went all night. And that really interrupted my day. And I spent, because I spent my afternoons at the Oakland Library in the uh, history room. And there I discovered that in the basement, there was a, a, a senior citizen at the time who was giving slideshows. This was before the internet. And uh, this was Paul Covell the father of the, our speaker tonight. And he was giving slideshows about his travels around the world and his studies of wildlife and nature. And he would, and, and so in order to, he was from five to seven and, uh, and that's how I met him. And then later he took me on hikes uh, at uh, Joaquin Miller Park. And, uh, you know, he was this amazing scientist and, and, and naturalist and, um, you know, he, during our time together, and I wanted to mention Redwood Park, another place where we hiked, and I could never keep up with him, although I considered him a senior citizen. Um, he, uh, his children never came up during that time. And somehow or another, I came to think of myself as his special boy. <laughs> and so two years ago, when I met uh, our speaker tonight, Jim Covell, it was like instantaneously getting an, an older brother, a bigger brother who was, uh, who was smarter and faster and <laughs> stronger, you know, and all the things that go along with having a big brother, just like immediately. And I resented that uh, until I came to reflect upon the idea that uh, his father, Paul Covell and his legacy uh, didn't just belong to me nor to Jim, but to uh, everybody who enjoys uh, Lake Merritt and visits Lake Merritt. And uh, with that, I want to just turn it back to Katie to uh, introduce our, our, our guest speaker. Thank, thank you, David. Those are uh, really important thoughts and a great you know, personal connection that Lake Merritt is able to have. So it's my great pleasure right mm -hmm. now to introduce James Covell, um, who is going to tell us some stories from the early days of Lake Merritt. And um, it is going to be a wonderful program. And um, Jim, are you uh, ready to take the um, podium? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And uh, again, welcome everybody. 
uh, David, thank you for your kind remarks. I, I can't think of a better little brother that I'd have. So uh, great to be with everybody this evening and share some stories from, uh, and we talk about the early days, really talking about the beginnings of the, the naturalist program and, and going back to uh, the early 1900s and how things kind of progressed through the, the 1960s anyhow. So that's the period of time we'll be looking at. And, uh, and I'll, I'll share quite a few of the stories that uh, about my dad's experience there because it seems like he was kind of at the heart of the, the naturalist program for many of those years. And uh, so with that as a, as a preface, let me get into sharing my screen here. And we'll get underway. Okay. So in the beginning, huh, um, so my father, Paul Covell, was somebody who was always a naturalist at heart. And when he was uh, growing up in the first couple of decades of the 1900s, uh, there wasn't really such a thing. Well, naturalists were people that, that uh, did a lot of taxonomy work on living things out in the field to a large extent. Um, so they were scientists and, and a lot of them were collectors. Um, that was the end of an era where we were still trying to document the, uh, the things that lived on this planet in many areas. And so my father, um, having grown up in the East, uh, moved out West, started out in San Diego and um, doing some uh, collecting work there, of plants and animals for Frank Stevens that wrote the first uh, mammalogy book of California. And by the late 1920s, he had moved up to the San Francisco Bay Area and Oakland and quickly discovered Lake Merritt. Um, so he was trying to make a living doing some collecting uh, plants and animals for the California Academy of Sciences that helped pay the rent and uh, but in his spare time, he was down at Lakeside Park and uh, studying the bird life there to a large extent. So um, the real beginnings of naturalists in Oakland really goes back to this gentleman, Bugs Kane, or Brighton C. Kane. Uh, he actually had a degree in entomology from Stanford, so that quickly earned him the name Bugs. But Bugs loved all living things and loved sharing it with others. So by about 1925, the Boy Scout Council in the Bay Area had hired him as a naturalist. And he ran a, a Boy Scout camp up in the Oaklands in the, um, the Montclair area. And two or three generations of, of boys uh, spent time at that camp and learned about living things of all varieties and learn to live, learn to love living things from uh, Bugs Kane. Do you have any black boys uh, in there? Here, um, no. no, and you know, that's something, as I've looked at this, the, uh, the participants are still, you know, mostly white male. And that's a, that's a whole other story along the way with, uh, um, <laughs> a story of with, with these programs, yeah. Um, Bugs is holding a rattlesnake here. And uh, he had several pet rattlesnakes and he handled them regularly uh, just to demonstrate that they were friendly and valuable and useful like any other snake. Uh, even though he was bitten on a couple of different occasions, he still continued to, uh, to show his, uh, his rattlesnake. So Bugs uh, also started spending a lot of time around Lake Merritt and talking about the waterfowl and the other birds around Lake Merritt. Uh, started the Oakland Ornithological Club uh, the group of bird fanciers, and that really started drawing attention to the wildlife around uh, Lake Merritt and Lakeside Park in the, the mid 1920s. The uh, city of Oakland had actually started feeding the ducks there in 1915. There was uh, an oil spill in the estuary, and when they opened the tidal gates uh, into Lake Merritt, a lot of that oil flowed into the lake and, uh, and oiled up a lot of waterfowl and, and uh, virtually all of them perished. And uh, the city felt so bad about that that the city council actually voted to spend some money to purchase grain to feed the ducks there. And they started feeding the ducks. Uh, originally, it was a couple of gardeners there that were assigned to Lake Merritt that uh, 
would feed the ducks every afternoon. So that had been going on pretty much on a daily basis since 1915 and, and went on for well over 100 years. Uh, about 1931, my dad started hanging out there at, uh, at Lake Merritt and uh, quickly noticed this duck feeding and thought, what an opportunity to tell people more about what's going on. So you can see him standing there in the background with an old cardboard megaphone talking to the assembled crowd there, uh, telling them about the waterfowl and, and uh, about Lake Merritt and its value as a waterfowl refuge. And uh, that originally was on Sunday afternoons and, and eventually expanded to seven days a week. Um, in one of the trivia questions, if you were for that trivia question, that was asking about the most common species of ducks back in that era. And the answer was, one of the answers was pintail. And you can see from this photo that it's, it's largely pintail that are there. Um, so the, and that's because there was a lot of shallow wetlands around the margins of San Francisco Bay that drew in pintail by the tens of thousands. Uh, and that included Lake Merritt. As San Francisco Bay was filled in in the next few decades, those shallow wetlands went away. There's really no place for dabbling ducks like pintails to feed, and their numbers declined pretty much in a straight line through the 1970s, where they're a pretty unusual sight now. I also want to point out in the back here, uh, this kind of wooden and chicken wire structure um, is a large banding trap. And that's another part of the story at Lake Merritt. Um, and, it, and while we have this picture up, let me just explain that um, as the ducks were gathered there for the feeding, eventually uh, we'd start throwing grain into that banding trap. The, these huge numbers of ducks would, of course, run in there to feed in the banding trap. We would drop the gates on there and they would be trapped inside there. Then we could go in and start um, removing ducks one at a time and banding them. And literally thousands and thousands of ducks were banded at, uh, at Lake Merritt. Starting about 1926, um, those early talks around uh, the duck pond, uh, the city didn't have any money to do that. Uh, so they were sponsored by the Lake Merritt Breakfast Club. And I always like to honor what they did in terms of, of uh, kind of taking up a collection and, and uh, paying, it wasn't an exorbitant uh, amount of money, but paying my dad to, uh, to be there to do those talks. And so the original naturalist program was really funded through the Lake Merritt Breakfast Club. And for a number of years, every, pretty much every Sunday afternoon, the uh, feeding talks were done under their auspices. So a little bit more modern picture here that uh, this is into the early 1960s. And you can still see quite a few pintail there. Um, by now, my dad had traded in his megaphone for an actual uh, public address system so that more people could hear what was going on. And uh, the duck pond had grown to some extent where we could uh, spread out more people and have more birds uh, on display out there. Another picture just showing the masses of birds that we used to get. And this is just a fraction of the number of birds that were actually out on Lake Merritt. There were additional feedings that went on uh, in the lake itself, down by the, the dome cage, and uh, in the early days, even along the shoreline up towards the Embarcadero. So I was talking bird banding, and, and uh, that actually started there before my dad arrived at Lake Merritt. Uh, there was a a gentleman from Piedmont is an avid sportsman and, and, uh, and was fascinated with bird banding. So he organized the early ba bird banding efforts starting about 1926. And uh, again, it was a huge opportunity to band uh, waterfowl. And that was our primary way of, of documenting uh, longevity and migration routes and a lot of important basic scientific information about waterfowl populations and population dynamics came through this bird banding program that was coordinated nationwide through the, back in those days, the Bureau of Sport Fisheries and Wildlife, and that evolved into the uh, Federal Fish and Wildlife Service. 
This is uh, Lee Stalkup, one of the naturalists there at the at the lake for a number of years in a, kind of a unique setup. This was a diving bird banding trap. It was, uh, I know it doesn't look like much, but it was a pretty specialized thing that was um, it was located between islands four and five, the, uh, out of the five duck islands there uh, in Lake Merritt. And uh, you can tell the water's not that deep, but it attracted diving ducks that came in from the lake. They were baited in with grain. They would follow that into the trap and, and, uh, and we would go out each morning and remove the diving ducks from that trap and ban them. And there were few, very few banding operations that were successful in capturing these diving ducks. So for a number of years, uh, large numbers of canvasbacks and golden eye and bufflehead and, and scop were banded there at uh, Lake Merritt. And, uh, and that made up a large portion of the, the banded diving ducks that we had on this flyway. In fact, for several years, um, there's a duck called the Barrows golden eye that uh, was relatively unusual on this flyway in the 19 uh, 50s and 60s and occasionally would get them in the trap and we were some of the only people banding Barrow's Golden Eye on this flyway. I've got a little video clip here that I'll run that uh, I think shows a little bit more of the banding trap in action. Let's see if we can play it here. There's Rex Burris. And we talked about earlier that had been there at the, the lake for over 40 years, feeding the ducks, going into the banding trap, casting some grain. You can see all the ducks headed for that banding trap. A few of the pelicans that were uh, prominent there at the lake for many, many years still are. Things like uh, ringneck ducks and, and uh, widgeon that I don't see much of there anymore, canvas backs. When I was there a few weeks ago, I saw one canvas back. So here's another one of the naturalists there, Lionel Kett, uh, netting birds in, the, uh, in that diving bird banding trap, the deep water banding trap, and, uh, and bring him over to a boat to, oh, well, we'll get past that, um, to complete the banding process. So, where does the Rotary Natural Science Center come into all of this? I have to tell you that um, at 1947 or so, um, the city of Oakland finally established not a naturalist position, but a downtown ranger position. And, uh, and my dad who had been doing so much of this naturalist work as a volunteer or, or paid through the breakfast club uh, was actually then offered a job with the city as the downtown ranger. And uh, that was a separate job description. It didn't involve much patrol work, but it involved walking around the parks and talking to a lot of people. And that was exactly what he loved to do. Uh, a couple of years after that, uh, this gentleman, Bill Mott, who uh, became the, the uh, superintendent for uh, uh, the city of Oakland uh, was able to talk the city and the Civil Service Commission into establishing a new job description as the Oakland Park Naturalist. So uh, that was, and then uh, of course they had to give an exam and all those things. My dad wound up because of the experience he had coming in on the top of that and was able to gain that position. Now, I have to say that Bugs Kane was a volunteer municipal naturalist and the, that was uh, about 1925. So technically the first municipal park naturalist anywhere in the country um, probably was Bugs Kane doing that as a volunteer. And the city gave him an official naturalist badge just to uh, seal the deal. But the first, um, the first official paid position as a city naturalist anywhere in the country was uh, started uh, 1947 under the auspices of, of Bill Mott. Now there's another update to this. In 1951, uh, Bugs Kane um, passed away suddenly. And uh, 
the Boy Scout Council had sold uh, the scout camp up in the Montclair area. Uh, they had converted Bugs to being a scout executive working in a building downtown, which was not him at all. And, uh, and so it, Bugs was never quite the same after that. Uh, when he passed away in 1950, he left behind a pretty good collection of natural history books and specimens. And, and uh, so again, Bill Mott seized upon that saying, we need to provide a home for Bugs Kane's materials. And Lakeside Park would be a great place to do it. And maybe it could be a home for the naturalist program altogether. So I have to say up to this time, my dad was working uh, from a desk that was in the gardener's shack between the two public rooms for Lakeside Park, which were over actually where the outdoor deck is for Lake Merritt Institute these days. Uh, dug into the ground underneath that was uh, an old concrete building that housed uh, a men's room and a ladies room. And in the center was a closet where the gardeners stored their hoses and, and hand tools and uh, they moved the desk in there for my dad to work at. So he was very excited when Bill Mott uh, starts campaign to build a nature center uh, in honor of Bugs Kane that would hold his materials and become a new home for the, the uh, naturalist program. So here I've got to give credit to the Oakland Rotary Club. They uh, pledged to provide a lot of the funding for that uh, building. And, uh, and Bill found a contractor that was willing to do the work. And I think the contractor probably did it at a significant loss as well, but he was in to, to make sure that it was completed. Uh, there were some fundraisers. I'll show you uh, one example of that a little bit later on. And, uh, and finally, they were about $10,000 short in, uh, in that building and the city provided the last $10,000 and uh, construction was underway. So in September of 1953, this is what we had, the Rotary Natural Science Center. And uh, I'm sure most of you, well, hopefully most of you have been in there before it closed and, and uh, hopefully we'll get it open again here sometime soon. Had a large central auditorium with about 85 seats that, uh, where we could do classroom programs and, and uh, weekend public programs. Uh, there were exhibits around the sides of that auditorium. On the right-hand side, that big window was an office for the naturalist staff. And uh, the back part of the building was the, uh, the Bugs Kane Memorial Library and uh, another back storage room with uh, specimens. And so that was, became the home for Bugs Kane's collection as well as the home for the naturalist program. So, I don't know if any of you have seen this plaque. It's, uh, it's on the side of the building. It was <laughs> covered up under ivy for many years and, and now is once again uh, uh, easy to spot. It, it's, it reads for education and exploration through an understanding of the value of conserving the natural resources of the state. And uh, I always liked the way that was put because this was more than a natural history education program. It was really an effort to connect the people of Oakland and beyond with natural resources like the waterfowl and other wildlife resources and fisheries resources. And uh, that was very much at the core of, of what they endeavored to do with the naturalist program. Probably some of you are watching this evening. Uh, first saw the Rotary Natural Science Center like this coming as a school group. And there's the naturalist Lee Stalkup uh, welcoming in a school group. And I think virtually every school child in Oakland in the 1950s, 60s, maybe into the, well into the 70s um, had a field trip to the Rotary Natural Science Center at least once. And probably had a, a program in the auditorium there as well as maybe a walk down to the water's edge to look at some of the wildlife and, and waterfowl there. And that was just a part of growing up in Oakland and it made sure that that every citizen in Oakland was um, connected to um, the incredible natural heritage that exists in around Oakland. So 
still an important perspective that I think everybody deserves in that city. As I said, no field trip was complete without a, uh, a trip down the water's edge to, uh, to look at some of the, the waterfowl. And I'm sure probably some of the most popular things uh, when kids came to the lake, the beehive that was inside the nature center and the snakes we had in there, those are always a big hit. Um, the waterfowl around the lake. And for many years, we had a junior zoo there also. And you'll see some examples of the, the animals that were there. It was a chance for for kids growing up in an increasingly urban environment to connect with nature. Yeah, and that's something my dad was really committed to. And, and uh, he had a real love for nature and just wanted to make sure that that, uh, that was developed in, in everybody else. So along the way, um, that as the popularity of the naturalist program grew, uh, there were regular appearances on television shows. So this is, uh, I think this is from, uh, you know, this looks like it might be Children's Freeland. This may or might not have been filmed for television, but since the KTVU studios were nearby in those days, down in Jack London Square, uh, probably every couple of weeks, my dad was down there with a raccoon or a fawn or a snake or something else to do a special appearance on television. Uh, Cal Academy of Sciences ran a program for many years called Science in Action, and he appeared on that pretty regularly, talking about uh, animals and wildlife around Oakland and, and, uh, and Lake Merritt and the Oakland Hills. And again, continuing to grow the reach of the naturalist program. We had, uh, in addition to looking out for all of the the birds that came to the lake, um, that that Rotary Natural Science Center became kind of the de facto wildlife care center for injured and orphan animals in many ways in the, the 1950s and 60s. And um, so a lot of time and energy and resources went into uh, raising orphan animals and, and trying to get animals released back into the wild again. And it was a constant uh, stream of birds and, and uh, mammals that came through the nature center. And I have to tell you that um, because the nature center closed at five, those animals came home as well. So they got round the clock care. And uh, here's an example, a little screech owl that, uh, that grew up with. We had lots of owls, lots of raccoons, um, skunks and possums and, um, well, here's a good example. This is what my home life was like um, growing up with all of these wild critters that shared our house. And I have to tell you, my mother was an absolute saint. She thought all this was exciting and uh, interesting, and she didn't mind these animals running all over the house and the, the bats in the water heater closet and the um, gust of porcupine chewing on the legs of her prized uh, dining room set, uh, all of those things that would have upset a lot of people. <laughs> she just thought that was, that was uh, part of the deal and enjoyed all of it. So let's see, I have another video clip here. Um, and these were home movies that, uh, that my dad shot. So, you know, the quality was what it was. And, uh, but it gives you some insight. These are just a few clips of some of the animals that we raised around Lakeside Park. So here's Rex Burris with a bantail pigeon that uh, came in as an injured animal. And uh, Rex worked with that and, and uh, got it back on its feet, back on the wing again, and, and eventually released. Here's one of the screech owls that, uh, that we had. And a lot of times a tree would fall over, somebody would find a nest in it, raccoons living in it. Uh, other animals, the, the mom might have been hit the road and people would find the youngsters hanging out still with mom. And uh, those things all wound up uh, with us at the, at the nature center. Raccoons, it seems like every year we had four or five or six raccoons that we were raising that were, again, orphans. And uh, they were a particular challenge because they're incredibly intelligent, uh, really have a lot of dexterity. You couldn't keep them out of anything and a lot of curiosity. So you had to keep an eye on them constantly. They're amazing animals. 
we spent a lot of time trying to give them experience in wild environments so they knew how to make a living when they got uh, released back out into the wild, including climbing trees. I remember as a youngster, if they got too far up the tree, that was one of my jobs was to go up there and get them back down again. This is actually at home. <laughs> and uh, you couldn't, couldn't open a cabinet or open a refrigerator without a raccoon following you. And um, that was my alarm clock. A lot of times in the morning, I'd have a raccoon sitting on my head putting its uh, paws in my ears and biting on my hair. Another raccoon on my chest, bringing its paws up my nose and biting my chin. And a third raccoon chewing on my toes. I would dare anybody to sleep through that. Fawns were a regular uh, orphan as well. It seems like every year we had fawns where mom had been uh, hit by a car, chased away by dogs and and uh, these fawns were brought to us. And we'd get them, uh, get them raised up and turned loose in the Oakland Hills. Some of them, uh, like Lucy, became pretty famous up uh, in the Oakland Hills. And of course, every kid in the neighborhood came over to see these animals when they came home with us or came down to Lakeside Park to, to see these orphans. I have to say, nowadays, we would not do anything like this. Uh, caring for orphan animals is completely different. Uh, we're doing a much better job avoiding imprinting them on humans and uh, much better ways to provide for nutrition and, and training as they grow up. So these were very early attempts. I have to tell you, they were well meant and done out of pure love for wildlife, but certainly not examples we would, uh, would emulate today on how we work with with orphan and injured wildlife. But it was the best we could do in those days. We didn't have many bobcats. That uh, was an animal that didn't come in very often, but pretty special when we did. We got skunks regularly, and as you can imagine, skunks require some special handling. Uh, here's a spotted skunk, which is uh, relatively usual in Northern California, but uh, occasionally we would, uh, would have spotted skunks. And then these three young striped skunks, I remember these vividly because when they came home, they were very fond of, of hiding out behind the refrigerator in the kitchen where it was nice and warm. Uh, Gus the porcupine, I loved Gus. Uh, we kind of grew up together. He was with us for 12 years. And uh, porcupines are really sweethearts once you get to know them. And certainly uh, Gus and I had a real special relationship. We had snakes as well. Didn't bring those home very often, but uh, they were a big part of the, the displays at the Nature Center. The sidewinder is not a local animal like the other rattlesnakes, but uh, had been brought up from somebody from the uh, deserts of Southern California. Eddie Parker was a local scout that spent a lot of time um, at Lakeside Park. He was showing off a couple of snakes there. And because my dad had been a collector down in the deserts, he was very comfortable around rattlesnakes. And we always had rattlesnakes to show as well. We'll wrap this up with Lionel Kett. Uh, Kett was not only a naturalist for years, but also was a beekeeper and uh, part of the Alameda County Beekeepers Association. He was responsible for installing and maintaining the uh, demonstration beehive there in the, in the nature center. And uh, what you are seeing here is a swarm of bees when they swarmed outside the nature center. And uh, so Ket was capturing the swarm and, and uh, introducing them to a new hive so he could, uh, could start a new hive out. And of course, here's some uh, some maintenance work, smoking the bees so they, they get a little bit drowsy and makes them much more docile so you can get inside and pull the frames out and do some uh, maintenance on the frames and the, and the beehive. Ket did all of that work and, and was responsible for educating lots and lots of people about the values of bees. I put in a couple of images, just other stories um, from around the lake, some important visitors uh, or, or people that, uh, that turned up around Lakeside Park and Earl Warren. Uh, 
I think probably a lot of you know that he started his career as a district attorney for Alameda County and worked in the county courthouse on the edge of Lake Merritt. Uh, he lived up in Trestle Glen. And so every morning walked around the lake, he would walk from his home down to the courthouse to work and then walk home afterwards. And uh, so I don't know if he ever became a, a really popular bird watcher, but he stumbled across some of the early uh, uh, bird watching and banding operations that uh, were going on there. And uh, certainly always valued Lake Merritt and Lakeside Park. In 1948, Harry Truman was, uh, was coming to Oakland and uh, Harry was a pretty decent piano player. So he had agreed to uh, play at the, the bandstand there, Lakeside Park, uh, over towards the Fairyland side of the park. And the uh, problem is they didn't have a piano for him. So a um, call came from City Hall and, and uh, it was my dad and a couple of the gardeners got a truck and they went over to Sherman Clay in downtown Oakland, borrowed a piano and uh, they managed to move it up onto the bandstand and uh, so Harry could sit down and, and play and eventually had a crowd of over 10,000 people there at the bandstand uh, to listen to him play the piano and, and say a few wise words. And there are a lot of uh, pretty famous bird watchers, of course, that came through Oakland and uh, Lakeside Park. So one of the best known bird watchers in uh, North America was uh, this gentleman, Roger Torrey Peterson. And uh, Peterson loved to come down there. He had uh, relatives that lived in Carmel. So he would be out on this coast from time to time. He lived back east. Uh, and if he had an opportunity, he would get to Lake Merritt. And uh, it was a chance to get good close up photographs of the birds that he was uh, painting so he could capture the detail that he needed. Um, early in, uh, in my tenure at the Monterey Bay Aquarium, uh, I remember we had Roger Torrey Peterson come uh, to the aquarium, uh, again, visiting his relatives in Carmel. He came to the aquarium before opening where he could get into our aviary and, uh, and get really nose to beak with some of the shorebirds we had in there and, uh, and photograph the detail of scales on the legs and things like that that, that made his artwork uh, such remarkable detailed depictions of, of birds. Another feature that was certainly uh, part of the, in fact, you can see two things going on here that were done as part of the uh, enhancements for waterfowl. Uh, you can see a, a line in the water there kind of jutting out from the old boathouse parking lot and around the islands. That is a log boom that uh, in the winter months was stretched across the lake and it divided off half the lake so that boats couldn't get in there and that uh, so that was reserved strictly for the birds. And of course, the winter time is when we would get large numbers of birds and they liked having the peace and quiet of, uh, of their part of the lake without any disturbance from boats. I also wanted to point out these duck islands. Uh, the first island was built in about 1925, I think it was built with Phil from building the uh, Oakland Municipal Auditorium. And uh, they were excavating a lot of dirt there. That dirt was brought over here and, and uh, used to construct that first island that featured a, a freshwater pool. And uh, uh, just it created a nice space for ducks to nest. And, uh, and nest they did. And it was so successful that eventually four other islands were added to where um, the five islands provided a lot of uh, important habitat where everything from swans to Canada geese to nowadays uh, herons and egrets are nesting there. And it gives them some separation again from all of us humans around the side of the lake. So they're more comfortable there with nesting. The dome cage is uh, another story from the lake. Um, there's a gentleman by the name of Buck Minister Fuller. Everybody called him Bucky Fuller, uh, who was kind of a futurist. He was always talking about what things would look like on uh, into the future. And he came up with this idea of a geodesic dome. And it was, a, again, this spherical structure. There was no internal support 
and he was saying this was this was going to be um, a really easy to construct design for a building, and uh, you could put walls anywhere because there are no internal supports or bearing walls. And uh, Bill Mott heard about that uh, and thought, well, wait a minute. If there's no internal supports, that would be a great thing for birds also. They could fly around inside there and never run into anything. And uh, boy, he ran with that idea, got very excited about it, uh, talked to uh, Bucky Fuller and Fuller signed on to, to help design it. Uh, and they needed something to build it out of. And of course, Kaiser Aluminum had their new office building right there on the edge of, of Lake Merritt. So, uh, Bill Mott appealed to uh, Henry Kaiser about uh, providing aluminum to build this so that it would be a demonstration of what a great lightweight, strong building material uh, aluminum was. So uh, that's all it took. They had the space for it. Pretty soon the design was done. They started building this large ge geodesic dome cage. And it's there today. Um, at one point, it housed a lot of different birds. There were some raptors in there. It was a free flight cage. So um, if we had birds that did have some flight capability um, that were non-releasable, that was a good place for them. And, uh, and it was a real show place, a real draw for Lakeside Park. There was also a small junior zoo that was put in about 1962. And, uh, so that housed a variety of, again, mostly non-releasable animals, everything from ravens to quadamundi, to of course, raccoons and foxes and, and uh, opossums. So let's, oh, and then here's another um, little more modern version of the banding trap that, uh, that was built there. And of course, here's Rex with some of the original pelicans at the lake. And some of our first pelicans came from uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service uh, when they would be banding pelicans like up at Pyramid Lake. Uh, occasionally uh, pelicans were injured in that process or they would come across pelicans. Sometimes hunters, I don't know how, but they would mistake a pelican for a snow goose and shoot at it. Um, so these were essentially birds that couldn't fly that uh, were brought to Lakeside Park and, uh, and added a great deal to uh, not only the lake, but the feeding shows also as they chased you around looking for fish. I also have uh, all these Canada geese here. And uh, at one time, Canada geese numbers were really low. They were very scarce around the Bay Area. And uh, my dad, had kind of a goal of reintroducing birds that uh, had historically been around San Francisco Bay and uh, had been reduced or even left the bay. So bringing in the white pelicans again. And uh, he heard about a farmer up in uh, the Susun Bay area that uh, had uh, birds that were uh, crippled birds from the hunting areas around Grizzly Island and Joyce area. So my dad called him up and said, I hear you have a lot of, of uh, Canada geese that can't fly. And the farmer said, sure. And, and my father said, well, could we have some and bring them down to Lakeside Park? And the, the farmer agreed to it. So they went up there with a truck and put a bunch of uh, Canada geese into gunny sacks and brought them back down and released them around Lakeside Park. And uh, I don't have to tell you how successful that effort was to reintroduce Canada geese to the Bay Area now they're just about a pest in some areas. And I remember before he passed away, my father saying, you know, maybe that was one of the things that looked good at the beginning, but didn't turn out quite the way I had figured it would. But uh, that was in a lot of other waterfowl, it might be swans, it might be other species of geese, other ducks, a lot of birds that were non-releasable. They might be wing shot, um, birds that couldn't fly no longer, maybe they had other things going on with them. Um, the game wardens, the biologists, um, refuge managers were great about sending those birds to Lake Merritt where they could have a great home and, uh, and add to the diversity of birds that we had there. Uh, of course, adding to that diversity of birds, um, sometimes we get a lot of hybrid birds also. And uh, so that was a particular issue. 
for a number of years, they would be rounded up, sold in some markets downtown. The proceeds from the sales were given to the Wasung Service Foundation that in turn used that money to help build playgrounds in Oakland parks. Um, unfortunately, though, the, uh, kind of the, the fish and game wardens were having a hard time telling the, the ducks from Lake Merritt, the hybrid ducks from wild ducks. And of course, you can't sell wild ducks in a market. And uh, so eventually that operation was shut down. I remember my father got cited at one point and had to go to court and explain what was going on. And, and the case was dropped. We had not only um, a lot of orphaned animals brought to us, but it, people found dead animals. They brought them in as well. And uh, here's my dad actually stuffing a skunk. And uh, I was practicing uskrat there. And he taught me how to, to do, uh, how to prepare specimens. And actually I was able to work my way through college up at UC Davis, working with the wildlife department, preparing specimens there. So it turned out to be a pretty handy skill. Throughout, there was, starting with the old Oakland Ornithological Club and Bugs Cane, there were always teenagers around Lake Merritt that were helping to do a lot of important work. They were helping to study the lake. Um, you heard from Jim Carlton in our last uh, program. He was one of those teens that spent a lot of time around the lake. And uh, that's another important part of the legacy of that naturalist program. A lot of those teens went on to become important scientists and conservationists. And, uh, and they got a lot of good work done around the lake as well. And I know Katie Noonan continues to do that work with teams around Lake Merritt and studying the lake. And I hope that's something that goes on well into the future because it's a huge way for uh, the youth of Oakland to connect with Lake Merritt and with science and conservation. I'm gonna end with this. I'll start it playing here. This is a, uh, from a movie that was done by Laurel Reynolds. Um, and there's a whole story in and of itself. This movie in particular was put together uh, and shown all around the Bay Area as a fundraiser for the uh, building of the Rotary Natural Science Center. And uh, Laurel Reynolds was, uh, her husband was a, a noted physician around the Bay Area, but was a real naturalist at heart. He was a prominent scout leader. And uh, he loved bird watching and, and Laurel got involved in making movies of birds and then eventually making movies of all kinds of things. And uh, so she made a film here about Lake Merritt and the waterfowl. She made another film called An Island in Time that's shown all around the country, including in Congress to help promote uh, the unique value of point raised and was directly uh, responsible for helping establish Point Reyes as the second national seashore in uh, the United States. And uh, did a lot of other pretty amazing work, but this is just uh, a glimpse of some of her wildlife uh, waterfowl films. Again, you can see large numbers of pintail, the occasional mallard here and there. Um, just imagine the cacophony of all those birds with all this feeding going on. A lot of clacking, cacking, whistling, and and, uh, and flapping and splashing. Here's some snow geese. Again, I think these were probably uh, wing shot birds that were brought to us by the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service and State Fish and Game. And uh, at one point, we had uh, sometimes decent numbers of snow geese that would show at uh, Lake Merritt in the wintertime. And of course, these, these non-releasable birds were there year round. Here's my dad feeding some of the, the pintail there. We went through a lot of grain, mostly milo or sorghum that uh, was a good nutritious duck food. Uh, we haven't fed the ducks there in a long time now. And when you think about it, modeling the feeding wildlife probably is not the best thing to do in gathering ducks together in large numbers, especially migratory ducks, um, can lead to the spread of things like avian flu and avian cholera and duck enteritis. So 
Um, it was a good thing for many, many decades there. Uh, there is no more afternoon duck feeding and, and maybe for good reason. I think we're still feeding Hank, the one uh, remaining pelican year round around the lake. I have to tell you the little feed house where we prepared the food, we'd always have a bucket of fish out there ready for the pelican feeding. The pelicans eventually learned to just walk into the feed house and help themselves. Another unfortunate thing around the lake was uh, many times some of the winter rains would bring uh, oil off of the streets and, and uh, into the lake and we would have oil and waterfowl there. Here's a scop that uh, been gunked up pretty seriously. And of course, nowadays you wouldn't handle an oiled bird like that. We know uh, to take a lot more precautions and we have much better ways of, of cleaning up oiled wildlife of all sorts. We just did the best we could in those days. Here's a branch goose grazing on the grass across the street from the Rotary Science Center. I'm not sure when the last branch goose has been seen on Lakeside Park. They're a pretty unusual one now. So we used to have a lesser Canada geese, cackling geese around the lake. And white fronted geese, which uh, I think are fairly unusual now around uh, Merritt. In the springtime, there are always scads of ducklings. Uh, the mallards in particular are very successful and uh, literally thousands of ducklings that were hatched out on the, those duck islands around the lake. And uh, here on island number one is, uh, now these are mute swans, they're not native like our tundra swans, but uh, they were around the lake for many years and they would nest in a good year and we would have cygnets. So I know we're getting short on time here and uh, so I think I'm, I'm going to stop this. You have seen most all of, of what I have to show you this evening. And uh, maybe we have time for a few questions here. Uh, so let me go ahead and, and stop sharing my screen. So Jim, um, that was just amazing. We could go on and on uh, watching those great videos. Um, I'd like to um, take just about uh, five seconds if um, everyone can unmute and we'll all clap for your for you and we're going to go into the gallery view just so we can see everybody clapping all right, all right. Awesome. we're going to have um q and a and uh, everybody, you will stay unmuted, but um, if you would raise your hand um, to be recognized so that we um, have one at a time. And um, we have some chat wranglers who will help us um, pull some questions. This is going on with Denise um, on the real TV. Is this going to work, Patty? Is there anybody? Katie, you muted yourself, Katie. I am so sorry. So again, um, if you will uh, raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question, um, you are unmuted, but um, you can, um, but please uh, one at a time and raise your hand, okay? And then we're going to have a pause at eight and we open. Yeah. I'm not unmuted, I am muted. Yeah, unmuted. Katie, there are some questions that I took note of as the chat went on, if you'd like to hear them to start off with, or we can go yes. the other direction. You'd like Let's to go, go with that, Patty, that would be wonderful. Yeah, um, Alicia, uh, sorry, Aaliyah asked, why are the ducks being banded for studies or tracking? And uh, what happens is those ducks would wear those aluminum bands and then, uh, you know, maybe a hunter shoot one of those ducks a few years later, and whenever you recovered a bird with a band, you would take that band off, mail it into the Fish and Wildlife Service in Patuxent, Maryland, and they would look up the banding record, and they could tell where that bird was banded, how old it was when it was banded, uh, where it came from, and when you multiply that by tens of thousands of birds that were banded, um, 
pretty soon you can start to assemble words about their movement and longevity. We banded a snow goose at, uh, at Lake Merritt that was shot by a hunter in Siberia about three years later. One of the first bits of evidence that birds not only migrated up and down Pacific Flyway, but occasionally crossed over even to other continents. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, another question was, what do birds need on the islands? Well, they need fresh water. That, you know, Lake Merritt is, uh, is brackish to salt, salty. And uh, while, while they can um, remove the salt from water, if they're ingesting some salt water, they'd much rather have fresh water to drink and bathe in if they can. So the islands provide not only some shelter and habitat, separation from predators, but also several of the islands had freshwater pools so the birds could uh, get a drink and do some bathing there. Mm -hmm. Another there. question was from Amelia, do okay. the naturalists still shake the eggs of the Canada geese to control the oh. population? Oh, I, you know, I don't know. I know population control is a, is a big thing. Um, and, you know, that addling the eggs or in some places they oil eggs also. I have no idea if any of that is done around, uh, around Oakland or Lake Merritt. Okay, uh, Patty. Um, Patty, we're going to take a pause here now because we're uh, right at eight o'clock and we'd like to share. Um, Jim, can you stay around a little bit longer after sure, eight? Sure, sure. Great. Okay. So the plan is we're going to have a, um, a little wrap up here uh, for about three minutes okay. and then we will um, go back to more Q and A. So um, I'm going to share my screen and with great luck, I will um, be able to go to those last slides we wanted to share with you. Um, and so let me do that with luck, please. Yes, okay. All right. Um, so this is our wonderful pre uh, presentation of tonight. Um, uh, Betsy, would you like to um, help us out with these? Unmute, Betsy. Oh, yeah. Okay. The Rotary Nature Center Friends is a citizens group advocating for the Rotary Nature Center in Lakeside Park, delivering interpretive nature and science programs. Thank you. Um, Let's see, we need um, somebody to read this really fast, like, um, uh, like, okay, uh, it, Katie. Oh, thank you. Yes. Uh, our partners and collaborators include Oakland Mayor Libby Schaff, Honorable Nikki Bass, City Council Member, City Council Member Dan Cobb, and uh, outgoing Council Member Lynette McElhaney, the Sierra Club, East Bay Regional Park District, BART, Director Robert Rayburn, East Lake Neighbors. Frederick E. Hart Foundation for Educational Opportunity, the Oakland Zoo, California Conservation Society, San Francisco Elks Club, Lodge Number no. Three, San Francisco Save the Bay, East Bay for Everyone, Golden Gate Audubon Society, Lake Merritt Institute, Breakthrough Communities, Earth House, Golden Gate Audubon for a second time, Oakland Unified School District, the Environmental Justice Caucus, and the Oakland Works public works adopt a spot program and we thank, thank all of our you. collaborators partners and supporters and we should mention the lake merit.org um, website and the lake merit advocates who've been helpful too and, and very supportive okay absolutely, absolutely. and um, so uh, continue david as the primary stores of the lake merit wildlife refuge the rncf rotary nature center friends regularly hosts school groups and members of the general population at Lake Merritt for bird watching, nature walks, native plant identification, plant planting and weeding, and testing of lake water. Our activities are virtual and online or socially distanced in accordance with the uh, CDC and Alameda County Public Health directives related to COVID-19. Thank you. Okay, here we have our um, schedule of um, the first quarter of uh, 2021. We have some wonderful programs um, coming up ahead. Um, Janice, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you. Would you like to just um, say a bit about these, um, or what's coming up? Okay, what's coming up? Uh, well, we just experienced the stories from the early days at Lake Merritt, but on February Lakeside Chat, we're going to have 
uh, which is February the 5th, uh, The Earth, the City, and the Hidden Narratives of Race. Um, that's going to be with Carl Anthony and Paloma. The, my, my print is very small. Um, but anyways, of uh, uh, Breakthrough Pavel, Dr. Pavel. Communities. March, um, we're going to have Lakeside Chat on March the 5th. Um, it's birding at Lake Merritt by Hillary, is it Powell? Powers. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Powers. Uh, Golden Gate Audubon. And April, we're going to have Lakeside Chat on April the 9th. Uh, Nature versus Nasty, From Our Hands to Planet Earth, We're Talking Trash. And I, I'm sorry, but on my screen, I can't read the smaller print. So could you help me out? Um, just that uh, we will be sending out um, information about how to register for these. And just to mention that um, uh, Carl Anthony and Dr. Uh, Pavel, um, Hillary Powers, Dr. Richard Bailey, um, and if I missed anybody, um, they're in the, they're, they were in our program today. We really appreciate their coming and being part of the community of Lakeside Chats. Okay, one more, maybe. Oh, yes, it's coming up. We did that. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, I want to um, say thank you to everybody who has come tonight. If you have to leave now, thank you so thank much for, the, for being with us. And we will be, um, at this point, um, continuing our questions and answers. Oh, before, I'm going Oops. off script again. Thank you. For those of you who are still here, I wanted to take a moment and express a special thank to you to Katie Noonan for her tremendous work in terms of uh, supporting and developing the Rotary Nature Center friends and all the work we do at Lake Merritt for the Wildlife Refuge, and also for bringing this event and the other Lakeside Chats uh, apart. Uh, I'm her co-chair with the Rotary Nature Center friends, but I, I just wanted to acknowledge and honor her for the tremendous work that she has done and is doing, I believe, on behalf of our community and the Wildlife Refuge at Lake Merritt. Thank you so much, Katie Noonan. <laughs> That's so sweet of you. Um, yeah, I, you know, thank you so much, everybody, for being here and enjoying our wonderful wildlife refuge and with us. And, um, you know, it's a very special place. And I'm very happy to be involved in um, youth education here and just meeting all of you and supporting the Nature Center. Okay, so um, thank you again. Um, and I think, um, have I left anything else out, everybody? Can we go back now to uh, our... Post program, we're going to have um, questions and answers. Um, you can raise your hand to ask a question. And if you would like to share a short story, maybe, you know, 20 seconds or so, um, so that we can get through and, and hear from a lot of people who are still in the room. Um, I noticed a, a couple of questions in the queue, about yes. four. I'd like to state them. I didn't catch all the names of the uh, questioners, yeah. but. Uh, there was a uh, question. Well, I know this came from Aaliyah, uh, and that was, what is the Lake Merritt Breakfast Club? I want to can just name the other three or so. Um, what is the Lake Merritt Breakfast Club? Uh, was PETA involved or showing up in, in the history of the Rotary Nature Center and the Wildlife Refuge's uh, involvement? Was another uh, comment and question. And, um, uh, there was a question about what can be done to keep the lake clean and are there volunteer opportunities was the last one that I saw. Oh, no. One other, uh, I guess, bird feeding. Yes. No. <clears throat> if i uh, sorry to put all of that out there. But if, uh, okay, uh, Jim. So yeah. um, that or anybody else. Have that. See if I can remember all the questions now. Let me, let me take those one at a time. Um, so um, let me say that, that a lot of things that originally were part of the nature program, you know, we have learned so much. We have evolved a lot in terms of how we relate to other living things. And I, and I think that evolution has been in a good direction. So uh, where the junior zoo was very popular for a long time, Keeping animals in Kivity nowadays is a whole different ball game, both in terms of, of the public image as well as the uh, requirements for keeping an animal thriving in captivity. And uh, so doing it the way we did it back then probably would not work 
today. And so the, the junior zoo is no more. Uh, those animals are unreleasable. And, uh, you know, they, they did amazing work as animal ambassadors. But, uh, you know, we're a different society now. And so what, what we used to do, different. And the same thing with feeding the ducks. As I said, that when we fed those, that made a lot of sense. It went on for over 100 years. But we also realize now with the prevalence of various uh, waterfowl disease, and we have had in the past uh, waterfowl cholera, um, duck enteritis uh, at the lake. I remember some episodes of that. Uh, add avian flu to that now. Um, things that get together huge aggregations of, of migratory birds increase the risk of spreading those diseases. So for the health of the birds, it might be a good thing that, that we aren't doing those mass feedings anymore. Uh, what else, did, oh, was, was PETA involved? Um, we had um, more and more people expressing concern about uh, keeping animals at, and birds at uh, in the kind of the junior zoo setting. And I think that was an indicator of changing attitudes I like to think that that we were doing our job well of helping people connect and value wildlife more. And one of the ways to express that is, should we house them better and uh, and make better use of them? So um, I don't know if PETA specifically was involved, but certainly there were people that that were expressing the changing attitudes and putting some pressure on the city to change that. Um, in it and eventually it was changed and I to tell you my father had kind of mixed emotions because he had seen how powerful uh, those animals were in helping to connect people to nature but I think he also realized that uh, that people's concern about keeping animals is probably a healthy sign that we're evolving in our relationship to wildlife and, and eventually accepted that did I answer enough of those questions Yes, you have been doing, doing uh, quite well. I may be able to uh, feed you another. Okay. But that has to do with, uh, well, uh, I think these have been addressed in the uh, uh, chat a bit, but uh, keeping the lake clean and volunteer opportunities. I did see some notes in the chat uh, regarding both of those items. But if, uh, if there's a comment uh, from you, Jim, or somebody else directly related, we can take it. And I just, um, you know, I've seen huge, huge improvements in water quality, quality, quality at the lake. And uh, uh, again, kind of evolving as a, as a community in terms of, of uh, people are more aware now of storm drains and not putting anything down the drain because it's going to wind up at Merritt in, uh, for many parts of Oakland. Um, and uh, as well as a lot of things used to go in the lake are not available anymore. Some of the harsher chemicals that people used around their gardens and, and homes. Uh, so I think in a variety of ways, uh, deliberately and maybe unknowingly, we have been taking steps to improve water quality around the lake. Um, there's still lots of room for improvement there. And seasonal when we get a lot of rains, uh, probably still washings into the lake that we'd rather not see in there. But awareness, and again, I go back to the education as people get smarter and smarter about our interactions with, with the lake, uh, nobody wants to harm that resource and we're all doing more and more to, to take care of it. Uh, and I, there are probably a number of resources where you could find out more about how to uh, just maintain good water quality in general, no matter where you live. And if you live in the center part of Oakland, it's gonna help Lake Merritt. I'd like to just add that uh, our March, uh, our March Lakeside chat will discuss these matters further we'll, with uh, Dr. Richard Bailey of the Lake Merritt Institute and Vanessa Pope of uh, Mud Lab, uh, 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 zero plastic use operation on Lake Merritt. And that'll be the first week of, of March for those that are interested. Uh, Jim, there was two other things that came up. I noticed in the chat. You mentioned the infill for the islands uh, coming from the Oakland Auditorium, and someone responded, I believe, in the chat relative to the connection between the Rotary Nature Center, the Oakland Museum, and the uh, Civic Auditorium. 
uh, as a, as an intentional um, a matter. And so if, do you have a comment on that? Yeah. And then I'll, I'll, I'll the second thing to you and I'll, so that I don't have to speak again. Uh, are there any black kids in, in the picture? <laughs> now, yeah, that, you know, as I was putting these pictures together, let me start with that one because I was going through a lot of these old images and, and that was one of the first things that jumped out at me. Um, and the, um, the, a couple of things that came to mind, one of them in, for some of those older photos, a lot of the, uh, the black population in Oakland um, moved here around World War II and were involved in the war industries. It was, it was a great place to get a job and have a home and raise a family. And, uh, and so I think the evolution of the black community in Oakland took a big jump forward uh, during World War II. So some of those earlier images, the population of Oakland may have been a little bit different in those days. But certainly um, moving forward after the World War II era, we had uh, you know, an increasingly thriving black community in Oakland and uh, um, as school groups coming to the Nature Center, I think maybe um, they were a little bit more diverse. And, um, but there was a, some real lag time in terms of the day camp programs, the nature hikes, uh, things like that really appealing to a, a more diverse population. Uh, hopefully that has changed. I hope that's part of the evolution that the naturalist program has, uh, has undergone, that it has broader appeal, that it is more inclusive. Um, that certainly was a desire of, of, uh, of my father as, as he got close to retirement, he hired the first uh, black naturalist at the, uh, uh, Stephanie Benavides that was there oh, for many, God. many years. And uh, hey, that so, was probably my influence on him. Well, yeah, <laughs> it could, could well be. So that's, but again, it's just like improving the quality of the environment like Merritt. I think there's always going to be room to improve the, the diversity of the um, participants that take advantage of opportunities around the lake. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I would just like to add that I, I think that we have seen an increase in diversity of um, youth programs at Lake Merritt, both um, through Oakland Parks and Rec, through um, the programs that um, Rotary Nature Center Friends has provided over the last three years, been quite diverse, um, also um, the Boating Center. Um, and also, um, you know, there have been people, there are opportunities for young people to, to work. And I believe that the Nature Center was really the beginning of that. I saw um, several photos and I've actually communicated with people um, who have come to the Nature Center, um, who had an experience working at the Nature Center as a young person and uh, it was very meaningful. So I think it's such a resource there uh, to reach out to all kinds of people and to be there right at the lake. In the right place at the right time. Well, thank you so much for, for, okay. that. for those people who are still with us. I'd like to just segue that into yeah. our February uh, talk, uh, the Earth, the City, and the Hidden Narrative of Race, because that's going to be a, a real opportunity where we're going to try and tie together and connect uh, the things that we've talked about so far uh, in our lakeside chats, uh, starting with Jim Carlton and the uh, Beachcomber and the um, and it's uh, life here at Lake Merritt and the inspiration coming out of that. And now tonight with Jim Covell and the history of uh, the Rotary Nature Center and the Wildlife Refuge. And again, vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, I thank you so much, Jim, for your thoughtfulness and pointing out for those African-Americans and others who might look at these images and say, well, where are the black people? That there weren't any black people here at that time and, and mentioning that migration pattern. But again, we will be uh, talking about with Carl Anthony and Dr. Paloma Pavel at our next uh, February uh, Lakeside Chat, uh, the connection and, and the relationship between these things and uh, how it's uh, all interconnected. And I'll just say this, notice how Kaiser played a role <laughs> from supplying the aluminum for the geodesic geo dome 
to um, you know providing you know the uh, black population for Oakland to build the ships. <laughs> And so, uh, again, we will explore and discuss these in the future. So hopefully you can join us. Thank you. Um, we look forward to being with everyone. This is Paloma Pavel. And Carl and I were inspired by tonight's program and look forward to building on these themes next month. Thank you. Thank you so much. Looking forward to that. It's going to be... Uh, a wonderful presentation as well. Um, do we have any more questions that people would like to ask? Um, yes, Joy. Thank you, Katie. And I'm proudly wearing my uh, Nature Center <laughs> t-shirt <laughs> because last month I won the trivia question about who was the first uh, metropolitan uh, naturalist. And I knew that the answer was Paul Cavell. <laughs> so I want to say to Paul Cavell in heaven through you, Jim, thank you. Because I grew up uh, on Park Boulevard, my parents always brought me there. And uh, we often uh, had Girl Scout trips there. And uh, at, when I was at uh, Glenview School, we had field trips there. So I was just there more times than I can count. And I remember uh, my father and me bringing an injured uh, pigeon in a shoe box to the nature center. <laughs> So I really have just countless memories there. And if I may just ask you, I, I made a note of a sentence that you said, Point Reyes was the second national seashore in the US. Could you elaborate on that? I'm not sure exactly what that means. And finally, I wanted to ask uh, why Hank is by himself, why he doesn't have a partner or any kins pelicans at the lake so let me let me start with the point raised national seashore uh, that area to a lot of biologists they knew early on that was a very special area both in terms of cultural resources as well as as natural resources and there had been talk off and on uh probably through the, the, since the early 1950s of setting that aside somehow as a, as a state park or a national park or something. And, uh, and it, those just never got any traction. Laurel Reynolds had uh, shot a lot of footage out there and uh, she assembled that into this film, about an hour long film called An Island in Time. And she uh, showed that around the Bay Area, got picked up by the National Audubon Screen Tour. So it, it was shown in cities all around the country. Um, and, and eventually uh, some of the local um, congressional representatives and, and uh, Senator from California uh, got behind an effort to introduce some legislation to establish uh, not a national park, but a national seashore. So uh, national seashores are uh, like national parks, only they are specific coastal areas. The first one was Cape Cod National Seashore, uh, in about 1958, I think. And then uh, eventually they passed legislation. Laurel Reynolds showed this film to the U.S. Congress, and uh, and that kind of swung everybody into uh, passing this legislation. And President Kennedy signed the authorization to create Point Reyes National Seashore uh, 1962. The original was 53,000 acres there. Fantastic. Wow. Um, Jim, we have a question from Lila about uh, what kind of fish were fed to the uh, pelicans. Oh, gosh. Um, we would get, um, you know, we bought the fish wholesale in, uh, they came in big frozen blocks. And I remember there were a lot of sand dabs in those blocks and maybe night smelt. Um, and, I, and the reason I remember the big blocks is we had to take them out of the freezer and saw them um, 
so that we had fish ready in the afternoon. My dad was taking one of those blocks out of the freezer one day and being frozen fish, slipped right through his hands, fell on his and uh, and broke a couple of toes. Oh. And uh, the of course the you know he had to fill out a report and everybody in the in the city government was poking fun at him. It was the first time they ever had a, a workers' comp injury based on frozen fish. And uh, <laughs> That's, that's funny. Um, so what did happen? What about Hank, a partner? Oh, and then Hank. Hank so, um, <laughs> and I haven't been around Lakeside Park and Lake Merritt that much in the last 40 years, but uh, um, I expect we're not having a lot of non-releasable pelicans brought to the lake anymore by the Fish and Wildlife Service. And uh, so Hank may be the one remaining pelican that is there year round. But when I was up there a few weeks ago, it seems like I saw, I know I photographed a number of pelicans hanging out with Hank. And I think seasonally oh, when good. we have white pelicans, you know, migrating through the area, they come all the way down here to Monterey Bay um, that, um, you know, they say, wow, that looks like a pelican. Let's go land down there and check it out. So I think Hank probably still has seasonal company but uh, but not not year round. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm glad he has pals. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, for our lakeside chats and the work that we do, I think it's incumbent upon us to. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't do this at the start of our program, and we'll try to include it. But there was so much to cover. Um, we, you know, we have to, when we come together, acknowledge the uh, Ohlone and the uh, indigenous people that were here. If we're going to talk about these issues and, and our work and our history here in this time and, and plan for our future, I just think it's important, again, that we, um, at each of our gatherings, we acknowledge, well, to the uh, tremendous uh, sacrifice that they were uh, forced uh, to make uh, that we are all living out. So thank you for letting me say thank that. You, we'll, yes. we'll include it more uh, formally uh, in the future. And we, um, in our Lakeside chat, um, we're planning to have one uh, talk every month and uh, we are entertaining a diversity of topics um, from um, we're uh, so that we're going to um, be able to have really a community of discussion around the uh, lake and the ecology and the human population that lives here and how we all interact. So um, it's, it's got great potential. And I really thank everybody for being here tonight. And Jim, especially for a fantastic program. Those videos and those old photos are just amazing. Well, see. on a positive note, I've been studying Hank for the last two, three years. and. Uh, just like in my family, whenever, whenever, whenever those other uh, uh, pelicans show up, they treat Hank just like family. I watch them, mm -hmm. and they just, and then they take off uh, about their business. But I, to answer that question, I witnessed uh, over and over again Hank just having. They just go together like they were never apart, and they swim around and oh. hunt and fish together. Wow! So I, I do have, that. I do have one more question that I just cannot resist asking about uh, because um, feeding the ducks and the birds is a, is a hot but topic issue right now. Um, and um, I, in um, studying some of the species that are at Lake Mary, I noticed that many of them, in fact, um, are grain eaters um, in their, as part of their natural diet. But we've actually destroyed and, and cut off a lot of their access to um, the food that they used to eat. Is there a sensible way in which they might be, their needs might be addressed um, while they're coming through on the Pacific Flyway at Lake Merritt, uh, besides just blanket bans? Yeah, and I, you know, in the big picture, the numbers of birds, especially the, the what we call the dabbling ducks, the birds that feed in shallower water, that feed on a variety of, they, they love grain and insects. Uh, when I was up at UC Davis, I used to see large numbers of these birds in flooded rice fields, for example, or 
uh, rice had been harvested and they'd go through and clean it up. Um, and I'd, in the big picture, if we want to see some of those numbers again, we need to we're on restoring some of the shallow wetlands around the bay. And it's actually some great work going on down the Edwards National Wildlife Refuge in the South Bay. Um, you've got some small scale efforts going there around the edge of, of Merritt. All of those things make a big difference. If you bring back the habitat, the, the birds will follow. And uh, so it's, it's more than Lake Merritt. Lake Merritt is a reflection of what's going, around, uh, going on around the greater San Francisco Bay Area. But as we, you know, we're getting a little bit smarter and we find that we can restore nature in some places. And as we put some of those shallower wetlands back into place and, and uh, create some healthy habitats, we may start seeing greater and greater numbers of dabbling ducks um, pick up. Um, boy, I'd love to see some pintail out on the lake again. We saw one um, on the last uh, bird walk with Hillary Powers. Yeah, <laughs> it <great>. was one. <laughs> well, maybe maybe that'll bring friends in the future. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, Jim, forgive me. That I feel as though that doesn't go directly to my, and I think many of us concern around feeding or not feeding the, the birds and ducks at, at Lake Merritt and our concern that the bread and things that we feed them may in the long term produce a negative impact uh, versus the idea that it's already out of the bag and that the, 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 the populace uh, are so connected to feeding of the birds and, and what it would take to change that seems so um, such a challenge. Is it worth it? Uh, is that what needs to happen? Because that does seem like a very tall order given the uh, yeah. passion and connection that people have with feeding the birds at Lake Merritt. And you know, feeding an animal is probably one of the most basic acts or expressions of caring for that animal uh, in our human psyche. So I, I completely understand what drives people to do that. They are trying to be kind and nurture uh, things that they really value. and. Uh, Again, that, that's an educational role that there are ways to, to honor that animal and to, uh, to nurture it. And there are things that aren't so good for it. And yeah, certainly feeding bread to those, those birds not necessarily good for them. Um, and, and it, but it goes beyond what we feed them. Even if we went back to feeding Milo, which is a, a much more nutritious and natural diet for them, uh, it goes back to also some of the concerns I expressed that we have about uh, just aggregating large numbers of birds like that and uh, in creating conditions where we may actually encourage the spread of disease. And I think we have to think those things through. I really miss those feedings. You know, I grew up with that. And that was, it was a huge event for a long time. But uh, yeah, as I said, things are changing. We're learning a lot more. And some of those things that were really smart um, decades ago, we're finding that we need to rethink them. You know, for, and in general, I don't encourage feeding wildlife of any sort. And uh, we probably should not be modeling that necessarily, um, you know, in front of the general public. Although if we speak a few fish to Hank once in a while, maybe that's still okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, thank you for all of your thoughtfulness there. <laughs> thank you so much. So everybody, um, we're at 8.30 and it's um, probably time to bring our, our this chat to a close. I hope you'll come back for the next one. And Jim, thank you so much. Um, you can still put a question or in chat or send it to me and I will forward it to Jim. and. I will also uh, put together any um, any stories that you would like to share or memories that you'd like to share um, for the uh, post meeting um, document that I sent out. So, I mean, it's really been a great pleasure. I thank you all for being here. Thank and you, Kate and thanks, Dave. everybody. Thank you, <laughs> okay, Jim. Yes. Bye bye. Thank you bye. to everyone. Right. Thank bye you. Now. Bye. Thank you. This has been Bye, wonderful. Uh, can you hear me? This Bye, Adrian. Bye. 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 Bye, Dick.